Yeah, great stuff. Um, great. Well, firstly, thank you so much for um, for giving us your time this morning, guys. Really appreciate that uh, everyone's busy, but um, uh, thank you for joining us for our webinar on the now, next, and future um, of what we're terming the metaverse. Um, really, today. Uh, main objective is, is a couple of things really. We want to kind of um, give you a bit of an introduction to, um, to everything that's going on. As any of you will know who've been to our previous webinars, these are in no sense supposed to be sort of like a thinly veiled sales pitch. This is, we appreciate that you're giving us your time. So we want to make sure that you come away from this webinar with some really sort of maybe a little bit of inspiration and some really sort of practical guidance on the things that you could be doing and should be doing right now to, uh, to get um, ready for what's looking to be probably one of the most exciting um, and interesting spaces that's developing or, or sort of concepts at this stage developing um, to uh, to engage with consumers and shoppers and all sorts of different different things um, so just um, a little bit of um, sort of housekeeping in terms of what we're going to be going through today um, we will absolutely be having a, uh, I mean, as a startup, we're going to take a few minutes just to introduce ourselves. Um, I'm going to tell you who we've got here from Quantum and um, our friends over at Circus. We have Jay who uh, um, will introduce uh, his business and what they do. Um, we will kind of cover off an overview of what the metaverse actually is um, and, uh, and, and where it's at at its current sort of state. Then we're going to take a, a brief dive into what some of the brands are doing in the space at the moment, some of the exciting activations that are going on already, um, and then fundamentally um, what you guys need to be doing to, to um, get ready for this exciting space and what we can do to, to try and make the most of this opportunity as it, as it starts to build and unfold and, and, um, and develop. Um, at the end of it, we're going to have a Q&A session. So um, if you wouldn't mind saving any of your questions until the end of the presentation, um, that would be great. Um, we are going to be here um, to answer any and all questions, um, or hopefully to the best of our, our advantage, uh, best of our um, uh, ability. Um, and then we're also going to set up a separate environment, which we can all go into, which will be sort of like a virtual networking space as well. So. Um, just as a, another way to further that virtual experience. Um, so who we've got today, um, guys, if you want to say hello, I'm Jody. I'm the Head of Strategic Partnerships and Business Development over at Quantum. Um, oh, are you, um, are you I'll give you... driving this? <laughs> <laughs> um, and I we think other people are in a little clip. <laughs> Yo, Hi, guys. Nice, nice to see you all. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> Okay, um, and we have Jay from uh, Circus. Hello. Cool. Um, great stuff. So um, whilst I'm pleased to say we have some of our lovely, lovely clients in here, I'm aware there's probably a few of you um, who might not um, know who Quantum are and what we do. Um, so we'd be remiss not to explain who we are. Um, we are a brand experience agency that specialize in um, uh, food and beverage and at the broader FMCG categories. Um, and we primarily work with businesses and brands that need to think and act differently. And I think fundamentally, where we are specialized as a business, obviously we work in um, various different guises, but um, wherever we need to change behavior and take some brilliant creative strategy and turn it into action, that's where we're best placed to help. Um, and we do this um, across four pillars. Ooh, it's all right, Jay, I can, I can um, I'll do these slides on my uh, side. So um, brand and category, first and foremost, creating standout campaigns for both brands and category that really build and add value. Um, what we term as digital experiences, we know that our consumers see no barrier, barrier between digital and physical worlds, and neither should we. So um, building brands in those environments that um, uh, combine physical and digital, um, global and local, so working with uh, global creative and making that applicable to different markets with all sorts of different levels of um, resource, skill, and um, brand maturity, and of course, shopper and consumer, so creating campaigns that really um, change behaviors in the all-important um, moments of truth when brands need to activate and convert and change behavior. 
And of course, all of that wrapped in um, beautifully, carefully crafted creative. Ooh, hold on, it's all right. I can do I these think, uh, slides. I, th I think, I um, think if, any, if anyone clicks on the screen, it'll move. So. If it oh right, I see. On the okay. Screen. <laughs> okay, so all beautifully wrapped in carefully crafted creative that really changes behavior by winning hearts and minds. And as I say, we're lucky enough to have some of our lovely clients here who hopefully will attest to that, but our creatives really are next level and um, do an amazing job at um, bringing that to life. And these are a handful of the clients that we currently work with, um, some of which are here today. And that's basically who we are. So I'll hand over to Jay to talk a little bit about Circus. All right, thank you very much. And, and thanks for having me. Um, uh, I've put a picture of what I actually look like over there because I realized that most of you will have met Jody and Daz and the others uh, before, but we may not have. So uh, this is not what I normally look like, <laughs> that roughly speaking is. Um, but yeah, it's great to be able to talk to you all um, today. And we're really excited about what the metaverse means for for brands. So, so what we're essentially um, going to do, I'll, I'll just tell you a bit about us. So we're a London-based um, creative agency. We specialize in using immersive media to create brand experiences um, and tools for business that, that solve the challenges, particularly acute these days, of uh, the limitations of the physical world. And, and we're passionate about doing things virtually. Um, and the metaverse is the next and perhaps greatest expression of that trend. So what I'm going to try and do today is to answer three questions. Uh, what is the metaverse? Is it a load of rubbish? And what should I, as a brand owner, be doing about it? Um, there's a lot to talk about, and I realize there'll be a mix of, of knowledge in the room, but, but hopefully this will be, will be something for everybody. So what is the metaverse? If you, if you read about it, you'll find lots of different definitions. Um, people talk about it as the future of the internet, the next evolution of the internet. Um, uh, if you've seen movies like Ready Player one you'll already have a, an idea in your mind of what it what it could be like but this is the best definition that we've yet come across um, for what the metaverse is it's a little bit academic so what i'm going to do is break it down into what does it actually mean so the metaverse is an expansive it's big it's a, a large uh, environment um, of lots of connected networked spaces so we are right now this moment in a metaverse type environment this is a an auditorium uh, it could be one of a network of different spaces that we could move between and explore and what you'll notice is that it's real time rendered so it changes as you change it if i if i pick up this dog and move it around the space itself changes and you can all experience that change um, but if i was to make this dog fly off into space and leave it there when we can next come back into the room it'll still be there. So it's persistent in that it is still here even if no one's looking at it, unlike, let's say, a web page. So a set of environments that are connected and navigable, that are essentially 3D environments or simulations of one kind or another, um, and that exist even if no one's looking at them. And those environments ought to be able to support continuity of things like identity. Now, we are all here as avatars, versions of ourselves, shall we say. And the way that we experience the physical world is as our embodied selves. And so this vision of the metaverse it should carry that uh, tendency through with it. So when you explore the metaverse, you ought to still feel like you. It shouldn't be that you're having to create new logins and a new avatar every time you uh, go to a new part of the metaverse. So again, Ready Player One's a great reference for this. The players, as they're called, create avatars, kit them out with accessories and clothes and capabilities and history. Um, and those avatars persist as they move through the metaverse. And there's already a company called Ready Player Me, wherein you, we all could create a personal avatar and use that same avatar across about 630 different games and platforms. So that feeling of being yourself as you move around is really important. And that self ought to be able to also carry with it its history, the things that you've accumulated and learned as you go, a set of objects that perhaps you've acquired along the way. Um, so here we go. I can reach into my digital wallet and manifest something that I owned a while ago. There's a, a Rubik's Cube, right? So that can sit in my digital wallet. That's an object that I own, my avatar owns, and I can then do things with it. I can hand it to Jody and make it disappear and and so on. So the persistence and continuity of myself 
the objects, my history, and then payments and entitlements. So this section is where you can see things like NFTs, objects, so the ability to own a digital object, that's an NFT. The ability to make payments and own assets in one way or another, that's cryptocurrency, that's blockchain, that's where all of those technologies suddenly come into play. Um, it should be able to be experienced synchronously by an effectively unlimited number of users. So we are all experiencing this environment at the same time in real time. We each have our own unique perspective on it. Now in this room, there's a limit of, let's say, 50 people, but the metaverse as a whole, there's no reason it could be effectively, to all intents and purposes, unlimited. So real people experiencing real things which change in response to their presence. And that takes us to the last part of it. And this is perhaps the most esoteric, but most interesting part of what the metaverse is, is that as a user, you have a, hi Alistair, no, thanks for joining us on stage. <laughs> if you click on a seat, you can uh, take your seat in the auditorium. Um, you have a sense of presence in that environment. Now compare this to navigating the internet. When you visit a website, you don't have the feeling of being anywhere other than looking at your screen. You don't have the feeling that you have arrived anywhere in any meaningful sense. You don't have the feeling that that website is responding to your presence or rem remember it in any way other than just gathering your data. So what makes the metaverse different and interesting and compelling for users is the fact that in it you have this sense of actually being there um, and it caring and responding to your presence and others seeing you in it. And that doesn't exist on the internet at the moment. So as a good example of this, we, Circus, now have moved all our team meetings from Zoom to Spatial, where we are now. So we have our team meetings in spaces like this. And I can tell you from having used it over a number of months that it's qualitatively different. We come away from those meetings feeling like we've actually shared a space as a team and had meaningful interactions in a way that Zoom is much more like information exchange. So that's um, a bit of a definition. Hopefully that, that, that made sense. But rightly with any new Hi, technology... Excited. Oh, um, Oksana, so. if you, I think, I know you've just joined us, so great to see you. Um, if you click on one of the seats, um, you'll be able to uh, grab a pew and, and uh, um, watch, the, uh, watch the rest of the presentation. Um, yeah, Thank just to, to kind of pick up on this question, um, Jay, I suppose as marketeers, we're quite commonly faced with all sorts of new and exciting sort of shiny new concepts. Um, do we feel that this could be, like, you know, the, I suppose to not to use the, um, the common vernacular of the next big thing, but could this just be the next flash in the pan or could it be, you know, the next sort of trend that will be superseded by something else? Or do we really think that this is going to be here to stay? Yeah, th that's a great question. It's, it's the right question mm -hmm. to ask of any new technology that gets super hyped. Um, and this is definitely one of them. Our, our feeling, and obviously we're somewhat biased, but it, you know, just looking at the raw evidence of what the big brands are doing, I think the suggestion is it, it is here to stay. I mean, Facebook, one of the biggest companies in the world, rebranded themselves in line with this. They called themselves Meta. They've made a big bet on this being the next best thing. And they, more than anyone, are capable of looking ahead to what's likely to be successful. You've got Microsoft uh, Mesh um, creating collaboration tools for, for work. Um, you've got a lot of VC funding happening. Um, headset penetration is way up and, and, and growing rapidly. So over a million UK residents now own a high-end VR headset. And what's interesting is, is that the upcoming generation are increasingly accepting this as a standard way of interacting. So look at the success of things like Fortnite and Roblox. And my own daughter is eight. She loves Roblox. She chats to people. You know, she interacts with people. She builds things. You know, it, it's remarkable. Things that we uh, grown up, shall we say, think uh, is, is a bit weird and new, they are already interacting with just as a matter of course. Um, so the combination, I think, of the, the big bets made by, by big brands, um, as well as that demographic trend, suggests that this is something that's here to stay and a real thing. I mean, I can talk a little bit about this trend as well. So this is this is more about VR, but it's a sort of proxy for the metaverse. So this is another reason why we think this is a, a real uh, situation. Um, so VR as a technology has languished a little bit over the last few years as you know, not really finding its feet, not finding its use cases and applications. So adoption has been creeping upwards, creeping upwards. But then over the last few years, it's really accelerated. So affordable hardware like the Oculus headsets that we're wearing now, 
more and more applications, games, way, ways to use the technology have pushed it upwards and adoption has gone mo moved beyond the early adopters to a bit more mainstream. But then the two big ones are COVID. Suddenly everyone needs to do things virtually. And so VR, virtual solutions, become more uh, required and essential. And then the announcement of the metaverse has given a lot of businesses confidence to explore and innovate in this area. What that's led to is that the audience size has reached a sufficient critical mass that last year Meta announced that they would allow advertising within the Oculus platform. And that changes everything, right? Because advertising money is going to fund new content. New content attracts bigger audiences, which attracts more advertising money to create new content. And so this flywheel is already spinning. And I think there's like a really interesting point as well. Like certainly um, like the cost of VR headsets has really kind of come down significantly to be relatively affordable. But also like this is the first time that I've really experienced um, like a virtual environment that you can easily navigate from a laptop as well. So you tend to see that um, these new technologies really start to evolve when they're um, in a state that can be really easy to adopt. And, you know, for anyone out there who um, hasn't yet tried like a VR headset in the last sort of few months, um, should we say, I'd really encourage you to, to, to do it. I mean, we've um, been enjoying doing this with the with the rest of the agency but sort of getting people to, to to really sort of embrace these virtual environments it's um yeah really really kind of fantastic yeah absolutely 100 percent. and and yeah the the need to own and bother powering up and strapping on a vr headset is a significant barrier it has been whereas now because we can do things like this on the laptop for now while wearables are still being developed it makes it just so much more accessible um so yeah that, that's a big a big improvement um, so, I mean, I, I can talk a little about how that then connects to the, the wider the wider question. So whether whether it's a load of rubbish is is less interesting than when it might be here. Um, so it's going to be an evolu evolving process and we won't really see a metaverse in the way that's been envisaged for probably at least 10 years because there are a number of things that need to be in place in order for it to come about. So just to explain what we're seeing here, this sort of constellation is showing Around the outside edges, these darker blobs are existing situations or technology that are essential components which will converge to create the, the, the building blocks, shall we say, of the metaverse. So you know, things like computing power and internet speeds, things like VR and AR adoption and familiarity, things like crypto, blockchain and NFTs to create security around how we interact with the metaverse. And then the way that um, brands and consumers are creating and using um, that content to uh, solidify those applications. So until those four components really mature, we won't see a version of the metaverse quite like the one that's envisaged. But you can already see that these dark blobs are already exist and therefore you know, we're on there, we're on the way and they are converging towards this central idea that brings them together into something that's actually useful uh, for, for life. Um, it, I think it's interesting also to, to have a look at what it could be like. So what do we actually mean by this? Like what, is, what could be the, net, the first metaverse type thing that we see? So th there are a few things that need to happen. So part of it is about how is the real world um, combined with this virtual world, right? We're physical beings. We have to interact with it. We have to load into it. We have to, we have to be there in some meaningful sense. So things like 3D modeling. So what used to take a very expensive studio and a lot of time to turn a physical object or person into a 3D object can now be done with a smartphone. And so that kind of physical to 3D part is already happening. The top middle here, um, you've got um, the next generation of Oculus headsets, uh, Meta has already announced, are going to have face tracking. So the avatars that we see around us now in the room that are quite crude and will blink and smile and, and talk a bit will be much more human and have those micro expressions baked in that make them feel more authentic. And then the top right here, the key part is wearables, right? We don't want to have to be strapping on a clunky VR headset. Wearables are an essential component. Um, and being able to put on a pair of glasses or contact lenses and have that layering of the real and the virtual is what will make it much more useful and, and, and available on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. And just recently, a company called LuxXL announced that they've perfected a technology where they can 3D print prescription lenses for smart glasses. So you know, that just goes to show that 
you know, the next generation of glasses that might look just like this can have that heads up display, that smart technology and be prescription for looking at the real world. So you know, it's coming together. Uh, at the bottom here, I think the, these are two really great examples. You know, they're, they're blocky because they're R&D, but, but here's two great examples of what, what the kinds of things that you could do in the metaverse. So on the left here, you've got the, um, the Brooklyn Nets, um, a basketball team in the US, who created what they call the Netiverse. Now, what they've done is they've put hundreds of cameras around their practice court. And what those cameras, along with a bunch of computers, are doing is real-time rendering a 3D model of the court and all the players as the game unfolds, right? So it's, they're shooting it from lots of different angles and turning it into a 3D model as, with, as you can see, a pretty decent level of image quality. Um, and what that means then is as, as a viewer, as a user, my slide, um, as the game is unfolding, you could be flying around the court under your own steam, every single watcher, viewer of this game could be flying around the court, watching from any position they like, flying between the players, getting up close um, through essentially a kind of invisible digital drone. Um, so, so that's a really interesting way to consume sports. Uh, over here, uh, there's a company called Vaho who make these high-end VR headsets. So there's currently on the market a $5,000 VR headset, which when you wear it, will 3D map the room around you. And what that means is other people can then load into that room and share that room with you. So you don't have to have spaces like the one we're in now, which is a you know, pre-built auditorium. You can stand in any space and invite anyone into it from anywhere in the world. So the analogy for this, I guess, is you know, movies like The Avengers and Kingsman, where you have a group of people around a table and some of them are joining as holograms and they seem to be sat at a table and actually sharing that physical space. Well, that's the technology that will get us there. So there's a couple of, of interesting examples. Cool. Um, the, the, I suppose the big thing that we always want to make sure that everyone gets out of these webinars, Jay, is, is you know, some kind of practical guidance and uh, um, an idea of what we can be doing now. So um, what are brands, um, what are the brands doing in the space and what should we all be doing to prepare for and get ourselves and our brands and our organizations ready for, for this when it starts to, to uh, materialize? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's lots of activity out there, lots of interest, lots of activity, and everybody's kind of doing their own thing. So, so what, what we've tried to do is to break this question up into kind of three categories of things that brands can do in order to take a step towards this envisioned, envisioned metaverse that will you know, evolve and arrive at some point in the, in the future. Um, so the first thing that you can do is what we call exploring the suburbs. So if you think back to that diagram I showed you with the constellation of blobs and the dark blobs around the edge that represented existing technology, which is not the metaverse, but is a, a component of the metaverse. These are the kinds of things that, that brands are, are quite commonly doing and really just testing the waters for what their, their audiences are interested in. So for example, over here we've got NFTs. So you can create NFTs, you can sell them. It's a nice piece of PR. Up here, you know, Glenn Fiddick famously did some, some great NFTs which are available on Blockbar, which is a you know, marketplace for, for drinks-related NFTs. Coca-Cola, Burberry, there's loads of examples out there. And it's not that difficult to do. Um, up here, you've got Dyson created a virtual store to try out products in virtual reality. That's worked really well. Um, down here is a project we're working on with a, a fire department, which is all about road safety training. So using uh, hazard perception in VR to, uh, to, to, to train and test people. Um, and then over here, some augmented reality examples. So you know, you'll have read about the virtual sneaker try-ons by, uh, uh, by Nike and, uh, and Gucci and others um, on, on pack um, augmented reality um, and, and that sort of thing. So, so again, things like NFTs, VR, AR, are components of the metaverse that are already available and, and well established um, that, that you can explore to see what your audience makes of it. Um, Jody, I'm, I can hand over to you to talk, or Daz perhaps, mm. about yeah. one, one particular example. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, we wanted to just touch on this one. This was a project that we ran um, last year, which was for Jim Beam. Um, and yeah, they, they came to us in the middle of the, the pandemic and, you know, with the challenge of, you know, guys, we really need to be able to engage with our customers whilst they're at home. Um, obviously, that 
the key kind of on trade experience you know reaching people in bar that were they have been removed for the first time you know in our lifetime certainly um so you know how could we go about that and how could we do that for them as a brand um and this was really uh kind of venturing into the augmented reality space uh but through because as joe and jody have both mentioned you know technology it just wasn't as advanced yet that we could you know um, explore something like the metaverse but web augmented reality was an area that we knew was evolving knew was developing and was an area that we could really um, create a, a wonderful experience for their consumers at home uh, and through the platform so so this is what we created we created um, an, uh, an a creator create a cocktail drink at home um, but through virtual reality so the difference between this being um, you know a website um, and just a a standard kind of game is that you would open up the virtual bar um, in your home environment so that could be your kitchen table or your work surfaces um, and then within your actual space um, you would then be able to build a drink through the platform so um, you had to add the pick your glass you had to um, try and check the ice into the glass and make it you know until there was enough ice in there for your that you were happy with for your drink uh, you could pour your bourbon you could garnish your drink you could pick whether you wanted lemon or lime um, or the different types of mixer so it really gave a, a really kind of rich experience for consumers but from home um, and this is really one of the first ways um, you know as the metaverse evolves where you know brands really can dip their toe into kind of bringing that at home experience to life um, and especially you know for, for food and beverage brands it is a really nice opportunity to do that um, and I think the key thing for us around this was that um, you know, initial conversations, you know, you think, oh, is AI is it going to be gimmicky? But the fact that, you know, people were spending, you know, kind of two and a half, three minutes just on on building one drink. Um, that's really rich brand engagement when people's attention span low, low these days. So that's one really nice example of yeah, how we did it. And I think there's other things for specifically for drinks brands as well, where, um, you know, people are engaging in different activities, you know, online poker and, and various other things where, where they are, you know, consuming and, and uh, drinking um, beverages. So, so being part of that uh, just gives you really great brand placement. And um, I know uh, when Jay and I first spoke, we were talking about, you know, this obviously it comes a little bit more down to the AR side of things than anything else. But, um, you know, creating those virtual brand experiences and, um, you know, transporting yourself to a, a tiki bar or, you know, the, the, the perfect environment to enjoy um, a Glenfiddich or, or something along those lines can be really exciting ways to sort of start to make those, those plays into, into um, a virtual space. Great, thank you. Um, so, so we just talked a little bit about what we call exploring the suburbs. So, so dipping a toe in one of the parts of the metaverse. Here's part two of three of things that brands are, are doing, um, which we call leasing land. So, this is really about playing in an existing metaverse, or more correctly, a micro metaverse. So, a kind of walled garden version of a metaverse. Um, so, you know, things like Decentraland, Fortnite, Roblox, Minecraft, Sandbox. In all cases, there are situations where brands have bought virtual land, have created something to generate some PR to see what users make of it. Um, and it means you don't have to create anything particularly from scratch. You can take advantage of the fact of a, an existing platform with an existing user base um, and see how it works for you and, and play with different ones. And each one will have its own different demographic. Or over here, um, you've got... Um, You've got more tools uh, for 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 kind of day-to-day -day use. Um, so, for example, you can use things like Horizon Worlds um, for socialising. You can use Microsoft Mesh for collaboration. Even tools like Spatial, like we're in now. Um, so, you know, dipping into existing platforms and making use of those as a way to test how your brand could use the technology, could uh, engage with consumers. Um, in them is a, is a nice, easy kind of light touch uh, way in. So that's part two of three. And then and the last one is to build your own. So if you really want to go guns blazing into the metaverse, um, then you can create your own micro metaverse. Um, so generally speaking, you're talking about a 3D environment, which you can design and conceive, uh, which can contain content that you wish people to share, can contain different types of functionality, can have its own style. Um, and wherein people can gather and interact with each other. Now, not necessarily in VR, as we've seen here. You can certainly use it, use um, uh, 
laptops and mobiles as well if necessary. But these examples is just some, so these three over here are projects of ours. So this is a, a virtual exhibition space uh, wherein a client of ours can launch products and, and, and have kind of virtual events. Um, uh, this is a, a farmer um, project to bring together practitioners um, around uh, particular diseases. And then this is a, a virtual exhibition space wherein sufferers of particular rare conditions can can come together to to meet each other and to, to share their stories. So these are some, some nice examples of 3D worlds that people can then share and interact in. Um, and then the one down here that I particularly like um, is uh, by Heineken. So Heineken has a slightly knowing, tongue-in-cheek project, created this micro metaverse uh, to launch Heineken Silver, which is a virtual beer. Um, but you can go in, you can create an avatar, you can um, chat with other other consumers and, and brand ambassadors who are in there. Um, and it, it's quite a fun little gamified experience. So they, it, it's a nice example of not taking this technology too seriously, um, but, but at the same time experimenting with what it can do. Um, so there's some, some good examples. Um, hopefully they make sense. Obviously there's loads of others. Um, and certainly some recommended reading, um, some things I would really suggest having a look at, um, which relate to some of the topics we've covered. Um, I think Jody's going to be sharing sharing the deck afterwards, so these these will work. Yeah, things. yeah, we'll share this um, this deck with you all um, afterwards, so so you can sort of um, dive into anyone who's got um, uh, an interest can dive into this in a bit more detail and and do some some sort of research and reading into it. Right. Cool. Okay. Thanks ever so much for that, Jay. That's brilliant. Um, so um, now on to um, questions, uh, the Q&A. Um, I mentioned, I know there's been a couple of people joining throughout, so um, we've asked everyone to sort of hold any questions back until we kind of went through the, the presentation just so we can make sure that we're, we're getting to everyone. But if you want to um, press, uh, if you have any questions, we'd love to hear them. Um, and if you press two on your um, keypad, then we'll see that you... Uh, uh, that have a have a question or would like to to ask something, so feel free to us uh, to to ask anything you like. Um, Daz, I've uh, got some questions. I've, I think I've obviously got questions, but um, <laughs> I thought I'd let anyone else jump in first. But um, I think yeah, for, from our side, yeah, a couple of practical ones really is around uh, kind of timings. You know, with the metaverse, we all feel like this is it's so new, right? And this is this is something that we're kind of watching unfold before our before our eyes. But how you know, what do you kind of see as the time frame on this of when this is really going to kind of, you know, kick off? Yeah, no, I think that's a great question. Um, what, what I will do before I answer it is just change our environment because one of the things that we can do that's kind of fun about this is be in control of where we are. So if you will hold on to your hats for a moment. All right. And there we go. Okay. It's a nice camera. There we go. We're back. All right. Um, <laughs> see underwoods in the fire but um <laughs> yeah a slight, slightly more appropriate environment for perhaps a, a more of a q a de type discussion um so yes yeah, so, so so when it when will it be here i think the answer is that there won't be a time when this grand metaverse is is unveiled it will be an evolving process exactly like the world wide web has been evolving over the last few decades um so bits and pieces of it will develop you know as we talked about those those um outer blobs of the constellation are, are maturing and converging so for example we couldn't have done what we're doing now two years ago the the technology wasn't there the vr headsets weren't there um, but now we can so a lot of the components of that description of the metaverse that i started with are possible right here today in spatial now it's not part of a connected network they, these avatars only exist in this little walled garden but that ability to load in and have a shared experience in a, in a 3d simulation well, we're, we're in it right now, and, that, and those technologies will start to come together. So I'll give you an example. We were having a conversation yesterday with a, an artist who, a very established street artist who wants to create a gallery of NFTs. So it's possible to create a virtual gallery populated with the walls hung with NFT digital artworks, which can then be bought within that virtual environment using cryptocurrency. So it's literally a, you know, a, a kind of micro metaverse wherein you can not just see stuff and chat to other people, but transact with that brand and that product. So it, it will come gradually and those, those blobs will converge over the next, let's say, 10 years. Um, but it, it's that kind of time scale, I think, until we have anything that really approaches the metaverse that's 
being described. Okay, and on the back of that, I guess one question that I guess a lot of people in the room would likely have would be around, you know, being a brand owner, um, what kind of type of, co- you know, as we all know how, how it works, we get budgets for each year, you know, what are people kind of looking at type of costs, you know, to, to start thinking about, right, if I want to bring my band into this space, for, you know, for my next year's brand planning, um, yeah, what, what are the kind of cost um, implications of getting involved in the metaverse? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, uh, one of those how long's a piece of string questions. But but to give some numbers to it, again, you know, the metaverse is not really available to to build in its full form. But there are components, things that you can do. So, for example, if you wanted to experiment with NFTs, creating an NFT is a little a little involved, and you've got to create up some accounts. You've got to buy some cryptocurrency, but it's perfectly easy to do. It would be possible to mint a set of NFTs for a few hundred pounds you know you could do that you could commission some artwork you could uh, go through the process um you know it'll cost you a few hundred pounds so you could do that as a as a toe in the water things like augmented reality and virtual reality experiences generally speaking you're talking sort of five figure budgets for most of them somewhere in that sort of ten to hundred thousand pound range you can do quite a lot um and then uh, those metaverse type projects that, that I showed earlier where it's actually creating from scratch a 3D environment which can be shared and manipulated. That's when it gets a bit more meaty and that's why you're certainly talking six figures above. So there's there's something for everybody. I think the, the interesting piece with that as well was just sort of experimenting with um, all the virtual reality kit that, that, um, that we use. Um, it's become an awful lot easier to start to build out those virtual environments with, you know, as you mentioned before, Jay, with kind of like using, and almost be done on a, on, um, through an iPad or for a phone or something like that. So it's, I think it's definitely changing. And I think, you know, mapping existing environments is going to become an awful lot more accessible for brands. Plus there's an awful lot of sort of shared spaces beginning to develop like this, you know, setting up a spatial account and, and using that and you know there's lots of environments to to engage with so it's definitely going to do that um piece around it you know might be expensive in the in the initial phases but it will certainly become more more um accessible absolutely yeah hmm. cool and i think one of the one of the big things um in terms of the nft piece as well that i certainly struggled with as as um someone from from a slightly previous generation is you know when when we first got involved with um like the digital evolution it was very much around you know you know the um napster and things like that where you would take content and be able to syndicate it really easily so you know we went from making recordings to and sharing them with our friends to being able to share you know a song or, or, or music with with thousands of people with no extra costs and i think where we need to sort of change our mindset is very much around sort of understanding that you know because of the advent of blockchain and because of the advent of, of really understanding originality and uniqueness is something that can be very easily displayed so um you know gucci i know launched a handbag recently in um uh in not roblox um in one of the gaming play in fortnite that actually sold for more than the actual physical handbag so you know being able to display the um ownership and originality of something and it be uh, immutable is, is, is um you know really quite an interesting sort of new space to get our heads around yeah can i just yeah, ask exactly. if um the does yeah does anyone in the room have a question liam was that your hand up did you want to just pose your question to guys Yes, thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks for the presentation today. It's all it's really fascinating stuff, and it's um, something I'm, I'm really keen to sort of see if I can get involved in. But I, I actually own a um, a video production company. We make some branded content and um, TV ads, etc. And I'm, this is like the metaverse is something that I would love to see if there is any way that I can get involved in down the line. Do you see any place for video in this at all, or is it all virtual? Yeah, I think that, that's that's actually something we were talking about recently because um, there's so much great content out there. We're so used as consumers to thinking of content as being on a flat, you know, 16 by 9 screen. Um, and uh, yeah, and suddenly the metaverse comes along and everything's 360 and 3D. But, but you know, we still want, we'll want to consume content, you know, um, within these 3D environments. We're still looking at this deck as a flat um, 2D piece of content. So I, I think I think it's two parts to the answer. One is 
um, those those three D environments will still be able to contain flat content like video, you know, just the way we watch TV now, um, and and so it you know it can be imported. Um, the other part of it is is we we have still have three sixty video, for example. So taking that video production uh, capability and translating it into uh, an immersive environment through either 360 video or VR 180 video, for example, which is a really interesting evolution of that technology, um, creates then content which can be ex experienced immersively as well as the 3D simulations of the type we're looking at now. So, so I think there's, there's opportunities for both. And by the way, you can mint a video as an NFT. So if you wanted to do something yourself straight away you know, this afternoon, you could mint one of your videos as an NFT. See what happens. I'll have to look into that. Thank you. Cool. I had a question. Sorry. <clears throat> so obviously, with these virtual worlds, um, like the gamification elements, so important. Um, I would imagine that some like corporate clients might be sort of uh, scared of the idea of, sort of incorporating play into their sort of their brand or whatever. Um, have you found that it's been hard to sort of bring over corporate clients or sort of less FMCG things, or have you found they've Sort of a number of industries have been have been interested in and happy to listen. Yeah, it, that's interesting. So, I think I, th I think there's definitely the perception that it's a gamified experience because a lot of the content that we see, you know, those those visuals that I showed you earlier of Fortnite and Roblox and so on, are all game. They're fundamentally games. They come from a games development heritage, and that's where a lot of the uh, the platforms have originated because that's who's developing that's who's got the capability to develop them but i don't actually think there's any need necessarily for metaverse immersive type experiences to be gamified or even look like games because you know when we go out into the real world we don't require for example shops to be gamified you know we like them to be enjoyable functional stylish experiences but we don't require them to be like a game in any way so the metaverse is really, if you think about it, more like a kind of parallel version of the real world, wherein we can do things like, you know, learn or, or buy stuff or, mm. um, it, you know, in, interact with, with people or brands. Not everything has to be a game in practice. It just looks that way at the moment because that's where it's come from. Um, so I think to answer your question, yes, a lot of the early stage conversations with brands is about, well, what does it actually look like? You know, that There is, uh, you know, one thing that we've talked about, you know, Jody and Daz and I is about, what does this metaverse look like? There's no requirement that all of the spaces in it look the same. There's no requirement that they all look like this 3D environment we're in now. Some could be really cartoonish and you know, um, sort of um, whimsical, and some could be really photorealistic and you know, let's say grown up. They don't even have to have the same physics, right? You can be floating around, you can be upside down. Um, so, so, so actually, as a brand, you can really be in control of authoring what kind of environment you want it to look like um, and if it's more grown up and more functional then that's great that's something you can do in the metaverse like you would normally do in real life it's really interesting i think yeah i think there's there's some really interesting areas around collaboration on you know you mentioned some of those environments earlier jay around um sort of pharma and um, medical sort of fields um not just from an engineering perspective but, but from a sharing technology and actually you know, um, being able to use it as a training and Im information share um, environment is is kind of really interesting as well. Um, so, so yeah, I think it's uh, could uh, could be any number of things really. Absolutely, great stuff. But, um, okay, anybody? Oh yeah, I've got a final question. Or a couple actually, that's okay. So um, I've been doing a bit of research, yeah. and I've seen things like Snapchat. They've introduced like these cus uh, custom landmarkers for creators to sort of create their own sort of um, AR experience. Um, how important do you think like the adoption of um, AR and VR is in these virtual worlds? Do you think that's like an en enabler for success, or do you think people can adopt it without sort of these sort of things? Yeah, it's. So at the moment, those are really the main ways into something that feels like a metaverse. You know, metaverse is in, fundamentally as an immersive experience of being somewhere mm -hmm. or being transported somewhere or interacting with something. Um, and so virtual reality and augmented reality are the two ways at the moment, given current technology, that you can really do that other than the web. Um, and the, you know, they're well established, so there's lots that you can do in that field. But what will happen 
it seems, is that those two will converge over time. So what VR, big clunky headsets, AR, slightly lim limited to the size of your phone screen, as those two con technologies converge in wearables. So imagine something that's as light and easy as a pair of glasses you can put on, but which then overlays what you're seeing in the real world with virtual content like a heads-up display. Right? So you can either see information layered on top of things that you're looking at, or you can fully you know, make the lenses fully opaque and transport yourself somewhere completely different you know, like, like we are now. So actually those two technologies will come together in wearables, and that's where things start to get really interesting. And are you guys finding the industry that's sort of taking this on sort of first and foremost? Because obviously like events, stadiums and things could do could do really well sort of create an experience for their for their um their audience. Is there any other interest, industries that you're finding have really adopted this and sort of running with it? Yeah, so um so the, the big ones are gaming, obviously. There's loads of you know uh, VR multiplayer games out there. Um enterprise, so businesses, particularly in the fields of training, so things like engineering, um, healthcare, where it's not that easy to get people inside things and patients and, you know, uh, and actually train in the real world. Doing it um, in VR works really well. So so the moment the, the big money is being spent on enterprise solutions for, for things like training um, and the projection, obviously military and things like that behind the scenes, um, um, there's actually projections that the one of the next big areas will be fitness. So um, people don't necessarily want to have to go to the gym, um, but they also don't want to be sat in their living room. So um, you know, the success of Peloton, um, and there's now VR equivalents. Um, so that's an interesting area that's that's got a lot of um, investment at the moment of, of how to use sort of immersive experiences to get people to be more motivated and be fitter. Um, but yeah, but the, there's loads. Um, to education when we're working in it a lot you know, with, with educators and trainers of one kind or another um, but then brands are often doing more experiential stuff so creating a brand activation which is a kind of self-contained celebration way of bringing consumers into the brand in some meaningful way excellent thank you very much all right great stuff um any other questions Cool. Um, so, Jay, I don't know if you want to set up the um, fourth or the last um, part of this morning's sort of virtual experience is just to take you into one final area um, where we can um, either catch up or have a little chat. If anyone wants to come talk to either Jay or myself or Daz um, independently, um, and just to set up a, a kind of um, a conversation if anyone wants to have one. Um, so if you um, click on the, uh, the the portal that Jay's um, set up for us, um, we can go into the gallery area and um, uh, we'll see you there. <laughs>